Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Terry Armstrong. I'm the marketing coordinator for Texas Orthopedic Specialists. And I'd like to welcome you all back to the hip and knee arthritis webinar series with Dr. Nathan Hale. For those of you who are new to the series, I just want to tell you a little bit about our practice. Um, we are Texas Orthopedic Specialists. We're a group of fellowship trained, board certified orthopedic surgeons and subspecialized doctors who provide comprehensive orthopedic and sports medicine solutions. We do have three locations. Our main office is in Bedford, Texas, with, off of 121 in Harwood. Our Keller office is off of North Riverside Drive and near 35W. And our Denton office, um, it's pretty close to Medical City, Denton. So we have three locations serving North Texas. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that we have covered, we finished up the knee portion last week. Dr. Hale talked about uh, revision knee replacement surgery. And you can rewatch any of the, four, the webinars he's covered so far in this series on YouTube. There's our YouTube channel there for you to, to check out and feel free to share them with anyone you think might you know, need to check them out or get information from them. Um, and we are moving on today to the hip. Dr. Hale will be talking about hip arthritis. So before we get started, just a reminder for all of you, please use the questions portion and ask any questions you have for Dr. Hale. He will try to get through all of them. He has been getting through all the questions in all the webinars. So feel free to ask him anything, even if it's a question about a previous webinar, about the knee or knee, knee replacement surgery, knee osteoarthritis, anything like that. Just go ahead and ask those questions and we'll get to them at the end of the discussion. All right, uh, let's go ahead and welcome back Dr. Hale. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to him right now. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Terry, for that introduction. And I, I want to get my camera set up here. But also want to reiterate what Terry said about utilizing the question box. If you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask, and we will get to all those at the beginning or at the end of, uh, of this presentation. So um, without further ado, we'll get started on the hip. So hip degenerative disease is a little bit different than knee in that uh, there's a lot of there's several different uh, <clears throat> disease processes that we run into on the hip side that we don't see very often in the knee as terry mentioned this is a, a overview of the of all of the webinars that we've done in this series um, and they are on our youtube channel so if you have questions about uh, knee or want to learn more about knee replacement robotic knee replacement or revision then please see our YouTube channel. Today we will start off with hip arthritis. And I thought we'd start with some anatomy of the hip. And this is uh, this slide's a little difficult to see, um, so don't worry too much about the, the labeling. We'll go over all that. Um, so this is, a, this is an example of the hip in its socket. It has a very strong capsule around it which we take advantage of um, keeping this intact and then repairing this after surgery in order to prevent complication. But as you can see, there's a, there's a large socket or a large uh, capsule here. This part uh, attached to the pelvis here is the acetabulum. You'll hear me say that word. It's kind of a big word for hip socket um, a lot. Over here on the side is the greater trochanter, which is this bump on the side of your hip, which is what you'll feel if you hurt on the lateral side or the outside of your hip. And then here is the lesser trochanter, and all these are parts of the hip. As we look over here to the dislocated uh, version, this is the femoral head. And when we do have acetabular, or I'm sorry, when we do have arthritis or other types of degenerative change, typically the thing that's involved is the, uh, the femoral head, which is here, and the acetabulum, or the socket, which is here. And, and when this cartilage wears out and this cartilage wears out, then we end up having arthritis. This uh, cross-sectional picture here shows the blood flow and how the blood flow comes off the uh, femoral artery into this smaller artery and then tracks along the neck and gives little vessels up into the head here. And many times these 
somewhere along the way, whether it's down here or, or up into the femoral head, this blood flow can get disrupted and that leads to a process called avascular necrosis, which we'll discuss in detail today. So this is a this is a kind of a repeat slide and what is arthritis? It's it's simply defined as painful inflammation and stiffness in the joints. Uh, in the knee, we talked about how rheumatoid arthritis is, was was very common when knee replacement first started 50, 60, 70 years ago. But because of the medical uh, treatment options that we have now, inflammatory arthritis is relatively rare as a cause of hip and knee replacement, uh, and and it is even more uncommon in the hip. Osteoarthritis is uh, a degenerative, meaning it once it starts, we don't really have a way to stop it. It's inflammatory, which is why some of the different medications work. And, and a lot of people refer to this as normal wear and tear arthritis. So again, if we look down at this picture, as opposed to this side that has healthy cartilage on the ball and the socket, this side has eroded areas of the ball and the socket, uh, and that leads to pain. Risk factors that, that we can change are if we strengthen our muscles, sometimes with physical therapy, we, can, we, we won't really stop arthritis, but we can stop the progression of pain. Um, if we have heavy physical stress or like a labor's job, that's going to that's gonna lead to a more rapid progression of arthritis. And then also high impact sports can, can also lead to progression of arthritis. Uh, again, that's more common in the knee than the hip. <clears throat> in the hip, we really notice more, I think there's a lot more uh, anatomical variants and anatomical causes for, for the, um, for the hip arthritis that we see. And then things that we just can't change about ourselves, our age, our genetics, and our, and our gender. And so females are uh, more commonly affected by arthritis than men. So the first type of degenerative disease of the hip that we'll cover today is called avascular necrosis. And that, that comes from the, the root word a meaning none and vascular meaning blood flow. So no blood flow, and that leads to necrosis or death of cells. And so, uh, over time, when there's no blood flow, the femoral head can uh, can collapse and become misshapen, as you'll see here. We'll go over this this X-ray a lot more in detail uh, a little bit later. But this is example an example of bilateral or uh, avascular necrosis in both hips. So causes radiation, trauma, infection. Uh, are some of the major causes. Um, a lot of times if patients ha have a history of cancer and they are required to have radiation treatment, that can lead to avascular necrosis. Uh, trauma, typically we think of uh, either an acetabulum fracture, in a, which is commonly seen in car wrecks, or a femoral neck fracture, which is, we'll go here, a femoral neck fracture would be a fracture through this part of the femur. And as I showed on that previous slide, that's where the blood flow enters and tracks up the femoral neck. And so it makes sense that if you have a fracture of the femoral neck and the blood flow is disrupted and doesn't heal, then that can lead to avascular necrosis. Infection is almost also a cause. Uh, infection in the hip is relatively uncommon in adults, but it's a more common problem in children. So some of the most devastating cases of degenerative disease of the hip actually occur in children that have had an infection which caused their blood flow to be compromised to their femoral head and then they're staring down the barrel of a, of a hip replacement or other major surgery at a very young age. Alcoholism and drug abuse can lead to avascular necrosis as well as blood clotting disorders such as sickle cell. Um, and then high dose steroids usually for long-term users such as patients that have had chronic asthma or cancer if, if you have a long history of uh, steroid use, that can lead to avascular necrosis. And then also antiviral medications commonly seen in the treatment of HIV. Uh, the second type of degenerative disease is, is called hip dysplasia. Uh, and that's, to, that's an under coverage of the acetabulum or you know, more easily described as a shallow socket. And the res this results in increased force localized to a small area. So if you remember back to your physics classes, pressure equals force divided by area. And that's 
the best way that I can explain this is talking about stepping on a nail. So if, if you step on one nail with your foot, you're going to have a problem. It's going to hurt really bad. But if you're able to spread that uh, out over a bed of nails, then it's not as painful. So this is when when we have a, a socket that is dysplastic or is is too shallow, then all the all the the force of a femoral of the femoral head is localized to one portion of the anterior uh, superior anterior lateral part of the acetabulum, which leads to a more rapid degenerative disease. This is an example of a patient of mine who was 43 years old at the time of her at the time of her surgery, and you can see on uh, on this X-ray that she has uh, a very shallow acetabulum in that it, rather than reaching over the entire aspect of her femoral head, it stops about right here. So this part is actually a bone spur and the, the part of her acetabulum that is that would be covering out to here doesn't actually work. So the things we look at to define uh, hip dysplasia are the latter. The first is the lateral center edge angle. And that is an angle drawn from the center of the femoral head and a vertical line straight up and then a diagonal line over to the edge of the acetabulum. And we want it to be, dysplasia is defined as anything less than 25 degrees. This patient's going to come in right about 12, 13 degrees. And so she, she dealt with dysplasia for a long period of time in her youth, always had hip pain. Uh, and then by the time she saw me, her cartilage was, was, uh, not healthy enough to perform any kind of uh, um, hip preservation procedure. And so she actually went on to, to uh, total hip replacement. Um, the upsloping up sloping roof or the source seal, which is, the, is this area I pointed out first, also uh, harkens to dysplasia. And then at, this, at that point, when you see this, you want to evaluate the cartilage on MRI. If cartilage is well maintained, then we can do uh, other types of surgery. But uh, when cartilage is de deteriorated, like this patient, um, hip replacement is is the way that you can treat this type of pain. So common symptoms: uh, pain in the hip is is the may is the most common presenting symptom. When, when that pain tracks down into the groin or the anterior hip, that is very reliably treated um, with, hip, with hip replacement. And that's, that's typically the hallmark for hip arthritis is pain down into the groin. It can present as posterior or lateral pain, but when the pain's more posterior or lateral, that often has a different cause than arthritis, such as um, tendonitis, some people will call it bursitis, trochanteric bursitis is a common diagnosis that patients will come into me with. Um, you can have tears of the muscles that help stabilize your pelvis. Some people call this the rotator cuff of the hip, as well as low back pain that can come from the sciatic nerve or arthritis in the back. And so so posterior and lateral pain is, is, is a lot more common than groin pain. And, and these types of things can often be treated with physical therapy, injections, pain medicine. Whereas when, the, when you've got pain that's coming from arthritis deep in the groin, we, we typically uh, fall back on hip replacement for that type of pain. Uh, stiffness is very common in patients that have arthritis. Uh, they'll notice when, when they try to get in and out of a car, or go upstairs, um, get in and out of bed, that, that the pain is a lot worse with that. And that's, that's typically an arthritic symptom. Uh, pain that's worse when you walk or stand and really is relieved when you sit would be a, uh, a sign of arthritis. If it's opposite of that, if you have a lot more pain with sitting, but you don't really hurt very much with standing, that can sometimes be uh, a symptom of what we call impingement. And that's uh, that's where the the acetabulum, rather than be being undercovered, is in dysplasia, it can actually be overcovered, and that's usually a, a, a disease of, of younger patients. Um, hip arthritis, as we mentioned before, is a, it's a degenerative process, meaning that once it once we start down the road of um, cartilage degradation and loss of joint space, that we we're gonna 
there's no way that we know in 2020 that can prevent the uh, progression of arthritis, but we can slow it down sometimes. It's also an inflammatory process, which uh, just there's various um, chemicals and cells in our body that uh, that travel to the hip when we are experiencing arthritis, and and that's a, those are pain generators as well. So. We take a team approach here at, at Texas Orthopedic Specialists, and there's lots of non-surgical options that can decrease the inflammation and slow down the degenerative process. So first of all, lifestyle changes. Um, weight is really more of an issue in the knee, and we, just, we, we hit on that in depth uh, in the webinar on knee arthritis. Um, but also uh, weight loss can help uh, with hip pain as well, especially if it's not uh, bone on bone. If, if you do have bone on bone um, hip arthritis, um, losing weight may help some, but it's probably not going to be as big of a as big of a help as in the knee. Um, weightlifting can help as well as low impact uh, or pool therapy, elliptical bicycling, especially when the degenerative disease is getting bad. Um, knowing what foods to eat is important. Uh, I do have some patients that, that need to go to see a bariatric surgeon or they need to be uh, plugged into a dietitian, somebody that can help with medically supervised weight loss. I feel, I feel very strongly that, that patients that, that are heavy and have struggled with their weight for a long time put a whole lot of undue pressure on themselves and, and try to solve this problem all by themselves. And the example I give is you know, the patient's here to see me for hip pain and, and, and you as the patient didn't try to fix your hip pain all by yourself because it's obviously a, a medical issue that you can't, you can't fix by yourself. And, and I think of weight as the same way. So if, if we have patients that are, that are heavy, then utilizing um, these resources that we can offer is, is oftentimes a good idea. So don't hesitate to do that. Assistive devices such as a, a uh, cane, a walker, uh, a toilet seat riser for the bathroom, and, and sock and shoe horns to help get shoes and socks on are, are things that we can help to, uh, to get by and to, and to put off surgery if, if you're starting to have uh, that kind of difficulty. Specifically, the shoe and sock horns for, <clears throat> for putting on shoes and socks uh, in patients that have hip arthritis because the, uh, the bone spurs build up and you you can't perform that motion of crossing your, your leg over your knee to put your shoes and socks on. So that becomes a, that becomes an issue for a lot of patients. And, and to be honest with you, it's a, a lot of times that's the deal breaker when they can't put their shoes and socks on, they come on in. And then home exercise program can also help as well. So um, non-surgical options include uh, formal physical therapy. If, if the muscles around the hip and there are many, if, if they're stronger, the, they can help take some of the uh, pressure off the bones of the hip and they can help with your hip pain, uh, especially if, if hip arthritis is mild and, and the, the pain generator is really more of muscular hip pain or low back pain. Physical therapy is an absolute home run and certainly something we should try before uh, defaulting to surgery in the, in the absence of bone on bone arthritis on x-rays. Um, <clears throat> oral medications, Tylenol can help at high doses. It's, it's a little bit difficult to get to those high doses um, in, in patients that are needing it for a long period of time. You have to take a lot of pills. And so, mo so most people opt away from Tylenol. Uh, I do see Tylenol will work really well in, um, in patients that are a little bit older. So over 80, Tylenol tends to work really well. Less than 80, not so much. Anti, so NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are the the best treatment that that I can offer. They they have side effects such that can affect your kidneys or your stomach. There's been some evidence that they can cause problems with the heart. Uh, but overall, most patients are healthy enough to take anti-inflammatories for a short period of time, and they they do offer unbelievable pain relief. <clears throat> And then tramadol is something that I'll use for patients that uh, have to delay their surgery for whatever reason for a short period of time. We may we may use tramadol uh, to get patients to surgery. It is a narcotic medication. Uh, it, it has much a much lower side effect profile than 
some of the stronger narcotics or opioid medications, and it has a lot lower risk of addiction. Uh, but it is still an it is still a narcotic, and I do try to avoid it um, and only use it when when I really have to. Uh, injections, uh, steroid injections of the hip are actually recommended by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and so I, I will use steroid injections uh, from time to time. Uh, one of the really nice w um, ways to utilize an injection is if we if I have that patient who does have more posterior or lateral pain and is we're really trying to figure out if this is more muscular or if it's uh, coming from the back we can actually put some numbing medicine into the hip and then if the pain goes away we know that the, that we need to look into the hip as the primary uh, pain generator. Uh, visco supplementation or or gel injections the, you may have heard it called rooster comb this is this can be used off label in the hip. It's it's not um, it's really more FDA approved for the knee. Um, I have heard of people doing it in the hip, but um, I would I would keep I would think that would be only in very rare circumstances. And platelet rich plasma um, would be a, a, a reasonable option, um, but I and I think stem cells, like I mentioned in the knee uh, um, presentation, is I don't think stem cells have a role in the treatment of arthritis at this point. Um, they may have some. They may have a role in the treatment of more muscular diseases or um, other inflammatory processes, but once we're once we're dealing with arthritis, cartilage loss, uh, injecting stem cells into a joint is not going to rebuild cartilage. So I, I don't recommend it. I recommend against stem cells in the setting of arthritis. Um, so so this is a this is a picture of a. Um, of a guy that had just what we call wear and tear arthritis or osteoarthritis um, you can look on the uh, on the patient's left hip which is which is this one here on the right side of your screen he has a normal shaped femoral head he has good joint space here and he doesn't have any bone spurs so as opposed to on this side where sclerosis is this bright white line here on the top of the uh, hip that represents um, hard bone and, and bone that has uh, developed at that spot because of this bone on bone arthritis um, that's developed the joint space is much lower on uh, on this patient on this patient's right than it is on the left and you can see that space here Osteophytes are, are bone spurs, which have formed at the side of the two yellow arrows here, and uh, the loss of the normal shape of the femoral head is seen on the right side. This is the picture from previously, which is, uh, this is an example of avascular necrosis, and this patient actually has, has it in both hips. We'll start on the, on the patient's right hip, which is the less severe. But there is sclerosis here in this x-ray, as you can see, that was similar to the last, this dark or bright white line here. There's cystic change which is within the femoral head. And so if you, if you look at the femoral neck, which has good blood flow and it has this nice uh, pattern of kind of a gray bone in here, then, then you compare that up into the femoral head where there's these darker circles here, 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 and then obviously the very large one here. Those are areas where the where the bone is no longer healthy because it hasn't had blood supply in so long. So on this side, there's a, a spherical femoral head. So we haven't we haven't lost uh, the shape of the femoral head, and we have not had femoral collapse, and we still are maintaining our joint space. So this patient was much less symptomatic on the right side. Now, if we look over to the left side. There's the sclerosis and the cystic change, which is similar to the other side, big cysts here, here, and then all throughout the hip. But also large osteophytes here and on the, on the socket side. Uh, joint space narrowing, you can see that the patient has no more joint space and this femoral head is actually collapsed uh, right in here. You see this big divot here. So uh, this patient was much more symptomatic on the left side and actually had this side done first, followed by the uh, right side several months later. Dysplasia, uh, this is a, a similar patient to the one we looked at previously. Uh, this, there's a few more uh, subtleties of this patient's uh, x-rays that we'll go into. Um, so her lateral center edge angle was about 14 uh, degrees. And a little history on this patient, she's uh, in her 50s, um, very active at work, 
has to be on her feet all the time and just couldn't get couldn't participate in the way that she wanted to anymore could not live the active lifestyle that she wanted so despite her well-maintained joint space which you can see here um, she had advanced um, degenerative disease of her hip and so that was caused by the this lateral center edge angle of 14 which we talked about um, being much less than the 25 that's required for the diagnosis of dysplasia if you look up where this red arrow shows that there's a large cyst in the in the um, in the acetabular bone so here and that's representative of degenerative disease there's also some bigger um, cysts over here in the femoral head and that's because most of the pressure is rather than being spread out throughout the entire socket or out or with a socket that covers over the rest of the femoral head all the vast majority of her pressure is driving right into this very small area on the anterior lateral aspect of her acetabulum. This is the MRI, which I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you what we've got here. This is her femoral head. You can see outlined here. The socket is outlined here. And then this large fluid filled cyst is is right there on the anterior lateral aspect of her socket. And so her her MRI was the was the clincher for her and that she uh, her degenerative disease was was too bad to perform any other type of treatment. Injections would would likely not help. Uh, preservation surgery likely would not help. And so the only recourse for this patient was a total hip replacement. So when when conservative treatment fails, this is our this is our first patient we looked at that just had osteoarthritis. This is an example of his hip replacement. Um, he is now doing well at about seven months out. Um, this is the patient that had bilateral uh, avascular necrosis, uh, and he is he's all he's had both of his sides done and is quite happy. And then this is our first patient that had. Uh, um, this was one of my uh, younger patients, and um, she, her, she, uh, she did have some complaints after surgery. Uh, she wasn't able to, she was still having to modify her CrossFit workouts. So, but other than that, she was happy. Um, and then this, this most recent one that I showed you uh, with the MRI, she's, her surgery um, was less than six weeks ago. And so we, have, we don't have her x-rays yet. But um, in closing, hip replacement is a, is a really great option for, for you if you have uh, advanced um, degenerative disease that's failed, all the other things we talked about, like physical therapy and anti-inflammatories and injections. And uh, I think it's the, one of the best surgeries that's ever been made. My, my mentor from fellowship called it the, the greatest surgery that's ever been created by man. And uh, that's just that's because the pain relief is so is so good and it's predictable and patients uh, truly can have a life changing um, surgery if if they're having um, pain that's bad enough. So um, at this with that, I'll I'll answer any questions. I want to thank you for taking your time to to spend with me on this webinar, and uh, I'll hand it back over to Terry and answer any questions that y'all may have. Yes, Dr. Hill, thank you so much. And, and I just want to encourage you all to, if you have any questions, you know, post them now. Um, but right now, I just wanted to ask you, Dr. Hill, when do you, when should people or patients schedule an appointment with you? At what point should they say, I need to see a specialist? I think that when, when you have hip pain, um, whether it's lateral, posterior, um, especially if you have groin pain, um, if you've tried anti-inflammatories, if you've tried physical therapy, you're, and you're not able to live the life you want to live, um, come see me. Uh, that's kind of my, my theory is we, we make a diagnosis, we figure out what the problem is, and then we offer treatment options. The, the best part of this is patients may say, well, I don't, I don't really want to have surgery. Well, well, that's fine. Um, nobody's going to, Nobody's going to suggest that we do that if it's not in your best interest. And if you if you are uh, somebody that's that's um, not leaning towards surgery, then a lot of times there's other things that we can do to to allow you to live the life you want to live and not be in such pain. Okay, I got a question for you. Um, 
from a gentleman named Tom. What is the recovery time for a total hip replacement? So on average, um, patients come into the hospital for the surgery and go home either the day of surgery or the next day. Uh, it's very seldom that I'll have a patient stay for two nights. Um, most patients stay one night. The day of surgery, you'll be up and walking with a walker. On the day after surgery, you'll do stairs and be ready to go home. <clears throat> the literature says that most patients will feel better than before surgery by six weeks. I find that most patients feel better than before surgery a lot earlier than that on the order of three to four weeks. Most patients that I see at the six week appointment are not having any more groin pain. They, there's some muscular pain that still lingers and uh, some patients will have a little bit of numbness or tingling to the lateral hip. Um, but other, but definitely by three months, you're back to normal. And, and by three months, I'll let people re return to any and all activities. The only thing I'll hold patients back, uh, I'll hold patients back from high impact activities such as mountain biking, um, road biking uphill, running, things like that. I, I, I hold people off from that for about three months, but as far as just getting back to walking and, uh, and back home and living your normal life, uh, I think on the order of uh, somewhere between four and six weeks. Marion asks, will I have the groin pain after a hip replacement? So if, if, your, main, if your main complaint is groin pain, and you do have arthritis on x-ray. So we've determined that the, the, the diagnosis of your, that your diagnosis is degenerative disease, then you, the numbers would say you have like 98% of patients are gonna have all their pain resolved. And so the anterior pain, the groin pain in patients that have arthritis is the most reliable treatment it's the most reliably treated pain that that I see. So um, what does that mean? If I have a patient that has bad arthritis and they come in and they say the groin pain's the worst, I really want to get rid of the groin pain, I can uh, I can virtually guarantee you that doing a hip replacement is going to take away the vast majority of that groin pain. Thank you, Dr. Hale. Um, Christine has a good question. She says, I have arthritis in my hip and knee, but at the same time have severe varicose veins. I've recently had two surgeries on my veins, but have recurring veins and pain. How will that affect or interfere with a potential hip and or knee replacement surgery? Uh, I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit. Was it that you said surgery on the veins? She's um, recently had two surgeries on her veins, but have recurring veins and pain. Okay. I'm assuming the pain is in the hip and knee. How will that affect or interfere with potential hip and or knee replacement surgery? So I don't think it will interfere with hip or knee replacement surgery. I, I do think that if some of the pain is coming from a source that's not the actual hip or knee joint, there can be some residual pain after surgery. But, but as far as you know, interfering with the surgery, um, interfering with the outcome, I don't think it would interfere much. Um, the one thing I would be cautious about is if uh, this may this this sounds a little bit crass, but the the only way the only pain we're going to help in a hip replacement is the pain that's coming from the hip. So if there's pain coming from other sources like the back or the veins, that can that can continue to be there and can continue to linger. But the as far as technically interfering with the hip replacement, I don't think it would at all. I think that kind of answers Marion's question. She followed up with her question about, will I have pain after hip replacement, groin pain? And she just asked, and back pain as well. But I think you just answered that with what you just the, said about it. And the back pain, the back pain's a little bit harder to, to uh, to predict because a lot of times, even if patients have some arthritis in the back, even if they have some of the posterior pain, if that patient has severe arthritis in their hips, doing the hip replacement is definitely worth it because there's some of the pain that's definitely going to get better. Now, it may not take away 
every iota of back pain, but most patients do see some improvement in their back pain, and some patients have complete resolution of their back pain along with their hip pain. So if it was me and I had to and I had a back problem and a hip problem, uh, I mean it would obviously be treated on a patient by patient basis, but I would I would likely treat the hip first and then and then treat the back if necessary. And the reason for that is because the hip is such a much more predictable surgery than a back surgery. Okay, I'm going to go back real fast to um, Christine's question that involved the varicose veins and the hip and knee pain. She said um, pain is also in her veins and circulation in legs. So I don't know if there's anything you can comment on that, but I just wanted to let you know that's what she followed up with. Yeah, sure. Typically, vein surgery is not something that that will uh, bother um, hip and knee replacement. If it's uh, if it's arterial surgery, sometimes that plays a bigger role. But typically, vein surgery or vein problems doesn't affect us. Okay, Marion asked if I need a knee replacement and a hip replacement, which comes first? So definitely, the hip replacement comes first. The a lot of times, hip pain can and actually radiate as knee to the knee. And I actually have a few patients that complain only of knee pain, but the, uh, the knee x-ray looks good. So then we look at the hip and the hip is actually what's bad. So I have a lady that, um, that, that actually is in that exact scenario, the exact situation. And we did her hip replacement first. She got really great relief. Um, and we may end up doing her knee first, her knee down the road, but hip replacement definitely comes first because sometimes the uh, the hip uh, is actually the main pain generator and the knee is not really that big of a deal. Okay, great. I just have um, one more question. I think is, um, you've answered it before in one of the webinars, but um, what do you recommend for people when they are searching for a specialist, um, in particular a hip and knee specialist like you? What should they look for when they're picking a surgeon? So number one, you have to find a patient that you trust, or you have to find a, a surgeon that you trust. Um, far and away, don't I wouldn't consider, I would consider nothing else. Um, actually, the first thing I would consider is that, that you feel comfortable with the surgeon and you feel like he's understanding your complaint and you feel like he's listening. So find somebody you trust. And then at, after that, it's it's uh, certain things you can look for. Um, I did a a fellowship in hip and knee replacement, and so that I took a lot of extra time uh, learning how to do these types of surgeries. And so I, I recommend uh, finding a fellowship trained hip and knee surgeon. Now that does that does not discount the many very well trained surgeons and the and very good surgeons that had their fellowship training in another thing or or even didn't do a fellowship at all because they there's many of them out there that provide high quality care but I think it's important to uh, to go to an expert and so for if for my recommendation I would say find a fellowship trained hip and knee surgeon and then after that it's you just have to find somebody that. Uh, that, that will answer your questions. I would do your own research and make sure that you kind of understand what conservative therapy means and make sure that you've uh, at least tried some things before surgery because the last thing you want to do is is proceed with surgery and and then not get better. And so finding somebody that's uh, that's thorough, that listens, and that actually uh, talks to you about about all your treatment options and then comes to a conclusion together with you is what I think is important. Um, a lot of people like to ask about certain types of surgery, and as the internet gets uh, more and more information on it, people are looking at certain types of approaches and certain types of prostheses. And and what I would say is, find the surgeon you that you trust, and let him or her make the decisions on the technical aspects of the surgery. Okay, great. And um, Christine posted one more question. She just said, thank you for answering my question. She's the one who asked about the veins and circulation. Right. I actually have advanced arthritis in my knee, bone on bone, and a moderate in my hip, but with spurs. I have much more pain in my hip than in my knee. Would I still do a hip over a knee replacement? 
I think that's probably a conversation that you would just have to have with your surgeon uh, after looking at x-rays and doing a physical exam and seeing uh, and then coming to a decision together about where the main uh, portion of your pain is coming from. A lot of times hip pain can be muscular. And so if, if we kind of decide that the pain is definitely from the arthritis, then, um, then I would still do the hip first, but it, it, it's kind of, that's kind of a nuanced answer and, and requires a little bit of a, 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 a little bit more information looking at x-rays and seeing an exam. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hale. I think that's all the questions, unless any more come in. Um, any last words for everybody? No, I, I, I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, I hope this has been educational to everyone. And uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, looks like we, I'll, I'll say a um, hello, special hello to, it looks like I have several family members on the uh, webinar. So thanks for joining in. And uh, thanks for all of my current patients and, and hopefully future patients that have joined in. So um, I'm um, thankful for the opportunity to do this and I appreciate your time. And thank you to you, Terry, for putting all this together. Oh, you're welcome. I'm excited for next week. I want to encourage everyone to join in because Dr. Hill is going to talk about um, direct anterior hip replacement surgery, which will be really interesting. Um, I think you'll all enjoy that. And um, let's see, uh, just a few other announcements. There's all of our links there, our Facebook and Twitter page, our YouTube channel. Um, if you think anybody would benefit from watching next week's direct anterior hip replacement surgery webinar, please share the link with them. All of this information can be found in the handout section of this webinar. You should be able to click on that and, and download anything. And all of Dr. Hill's previous, um, his previous PowerPoints are also on there for you to view at any time. All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us and I hope you all have a great, oh, Dr. Hale, did you have something else? Yeah, so um, I just wanted to I wanted to point out that on our YouTube channel we do have a um, a live surgery video uh, about direct anterior total hip replacement, and so that may be something that you want to uh, to view before the webinar next week, if you uh, either before or after, um, and you, that'll give you a, a much better um, kind of understanding of exactly what we do in the operating room. Yes, you're right. And I, I actually haven't posted. I'm going to post it today. So you should be able to find that today, everybody, and check it out. It's really cool. Okay, if that's it, well, I just want to thank you all again and have a wonderful day. And we'll see you same time next week.